Good afternoon, or morning, depending on what part of the country you're in. Uh, my name is Daryl Osterhout. I'm representing ASDWA, and we're hosting this this webinar for states. Uh, try to introduce you to the drinking water advisory toolbox. And I think uh, we weren't thinking about this when we scheduled it for Valentine's Day, but I think it's appropriate maybe that we that we do something like this on Valentine's Day. There's nothing that we do that protects our loved ones on a day like this more than make sure that everyone knows when there's an issue in the water system that needs to be communicated out to the public. So it's important that we do that. There's been a lot of investment by a number of individuals and organizations, uh, some of those represented here in the speakers panel. Uh, that went into this, and it's a good thing, I think, for all of the states to be familiar with. That's why we pulled this group together to try to give you an update uh, and make you a little more familiar with the process. So we have three presenters today. Uh, the first is Alan Roberson, who's Director of Federal Relations at AWWA here in Washington, D.C., we also have Jeannie Bailey, who's the Public Affairs Officer for Fairfax Water in Fairfax, Virginia, just outside of Washington. And Lisa Reagan, who's a principal at Aquavite in Arlington, Virginia. Actually, she's just down the road from us, from our offices at ASDWA. Before we start, um, violations are for the total coliform rule. It's by far the leading, the leading rule for violations, and then nitrate. It's also one of the, the, the higher number of violations. So we've got these uh, contaminants that have acute notifications, and then, of course, the whole slew of all the Tier 2 notifications for all the other chemical contaminants. The other thing is that it became very clear that we need to be better prepared, and preparedness, I think, is a great broad topic. Um, again, in my background, we've done a lot of work on security, and we're shifting a lot of that to preparedness now to be prepared for what you're going to do with a natural disaster. And the communications and these tools that are in the toolbox will help with that. So again, the, the, the overall goal of this project was to have a very practical toolkit that would be helpful for uh, utilities, primacy agencies, and health departments to use based on what was generally accepted best practices. So again, uh, we've collaborated with CDC in the past on some communication around cryptosporidium. But we recognized with CDC, uh, both of us recognized that we had to improve the, 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 the clarity in these advisories. The, the, the words are important. What you say and how people understand what you're saying uh, is critical. And then you want to be timely about it. And then how do you, at the same time, communicate the advisory areas? If you have a, a boil water advisory, but it's only for a portion of the city, what's the best way to communicate that? And then how do you have a, a stronger response for more severe events? And, and I'll show a slide coming up that shows the range of different events that this toolkit uh, can help out with. So again, uh, we're going to focus on the, uh, this is really, I say this toolbox is really a, a first step in a process to try and improve our communication collaboration, present clear information, but then as importantly, evaluate what we're doing and figure out how to improve this over time. And that's both at a, a local level and then a national level. In other words, how can what we've learned here uh, factor into the um, ongoing work on the Consumer Conference Report? If we need to go back at some point and revise the Public Notification Handbook, uh, how can we use what we learned in developing this toolkit to improve uh, future efforts? So we had a pretty diverse team working on this. Uh, myself and a, and a couple other staff from our association, uh, ASHTO, Ashto uh, Lisa from Aquavite, the National Environmental Health Association, and Jay Mobley Associates. We had, again, the, the, the sponsorship with the CDC. They provided the funding for this project. Uh, EPA was a partner. And then I'll show a, a large group at the end of the advisory group that had utilities, uh, AMWA, ASWA, uh, the private utilities at NAWC and NHO. So we tried to get a really diverse group to provide input on the toolbox. We had a pretty diverse geographical range of project uh, participation. Again, from this map, you can see uh, the different areas where the research was done, 
Uh, the interviews with local public health are shown in red. Uh, the crosshatch are where we came back with draft products and had the utility evaluate draft pieces of the toolbox. And then kind of the, the light blue are the, the cynical advisory group. And I have a slide at the end uh, that acknowledges all our participants. So how this was done, and again, a, a lot of this goes, uh, the credit goes to uh, Lisa for doing all these interviews in the document review. So there was an extensive interview process, uh, 31 utilities, 11 primacy agencies, and then 10 local public health departments. So you're talking about a city or a county level. Uh, Lisa, Lisa looked at more than 500 different uh, documents from uh, almost every state, three provinces, uh, different guidances, protocols, uh, fact sheets, how to conduct that exercise. That was put into a, a, a searchable database, and, and we used a, a search strategy to be able to try and extract these documents from the literature that's out there. So the point of this research was to try and capture a range of experiences, um, water system perceptions, customer perceptions, and some of the limited research that's been done on these issues. So what we found basically is that uh, on the public health side, there's a range of expertise and capacity. Uh, that's not really going to change very much given the current, econ current economic climate. One thing I'll talk about a lot is uh, development of relationships, trying to do that before. Uh, what happens when at a state level, when you've got a Department of Health that's different from the, the DEP or a DNR, which might be the privacy agency, and then how does the state interact with uh, local public health? From a utility point of view, uh, it's critical to understand the difference between operations and communications. And communications is both internal to the utility and, and external. Uh, the guys running the plants and the distribution system are focused on that. Uh, utilities need to understand the reasons behind the advisory so they can clearly communicate what you're supposed to do. Uh, the P in handbook is a, another tool a lot of people have found very helpful. But again, it's an important part to evaluate what you do and figure out how to improve your own processes uh, after you've had an event. So again, in, in looking at this, we need to have uh, uh, clear themes. We need uh, clear, consistent, and practical advice. And I think this toolbox does a lot of that. So uh, this is a picture of the cover of the toolbox. And I'll, the next couple of slides will show you how to get it from uh, CBC. And again, I, I talked about it before. We had this collaborative effort, uh, a slide a few more in the, in the deck will show how it covers almost any potential event you might have. It's a pretty logical process. I think one of the real benefits of this toolbox are the tools and the templates. There are lots of uh, blank pages that literally will walk you through how to, how to uh, go through this step-by-step -step process. And I think that's very useful to be able to have a, a, not just an academic book, but blank pieces of paper to try and fill in. And then there's more. Uh, places to go for more detailed resources, internet websites, URLs. If you want more information on a specific resource, here's how to get it. So a couple things about what this toolbox is not. It's not a cookbook approach. Uh, if a utility or a, a local health department wants to use that, it, it doesn't, it's not the same for everybody. We very quickly realized you can't have one size fits all. We needed a, a, a flexible approach, and that's what this toolbox allows agencies to do. And it's not a replacement for the regulatory requirements. It's a, a, a toolbox to help you meet the, the requirements or go beyond those requirements or even do stuff ahead of uh, any kind of issue where you're trying to provide information ahead of any real event. So this shows um, the CDC website. <clears throat> and uh, unfortunately, the, the, the lettering didn't come out, but it's at cdc.gov slash healthywater. And then you can see the different topics that are under healthy water. You'd go to the water-related emergencies and outbreaks. And then from that, in the, in the bottom right on, the, on those topics, you have the drink water advisory toolkits. And then this slide here shows the two different toolkits. The one at the top is the one that we're talking about, the communication toolbox. The one below that is another effort that I was involved in that really focuses on hospitals and healthcare facilities and what they need to do to plan for emergency water supply so they could be prepared uh, in the event of a water interruption. So that's a good uh, document for that sector, and it's nice for everyone to be aware of that, but we're really focusing on this toolkit at the top. So I think this slide uh, is informative in showing the wide range of situations that the 
toolbox can address. So on the left hand side you have informational kind of advisory. So this might be something though we're going to do construction in your area. Um, we're going to uh, we, 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 there's a hurricane coming three days from now maybe. We want you to be prepared you know uh, buy some bottled water, buy your flashlights, buy your batteries, if you do anything in water conservation. So these are uh, not as severe uh, the range can be kind of occasional and frequent as needed. And then you go through a whole range through boil water, do not drink, do not use, with the severity of the situation increasing from, from left to right. And also, then you also have decreasing frequency. You know, clearly a do not drink uh, is, not, is, is pretty infrequent. That's for um, a nitrite or nitrate MCL violation, chemical overfeed. Uh, unfortunately, we have a, a fair number of boil water notices. Those come from a, a loss of pressure, uh, a tier one microbial violation. Uh, you might have a, a natural disaster that again leads to that lower loss of pressure. And Jeannie will talk about her uh, blessed event here coming up uh, after my presentation. So again, I think this <clears throat> slide does a nice job of showing how it's not just to meet the regulatory requirements of boil water, it's to address situations on either side of that uh, regulatory event. So again, we have three stages of the toolbox, uh, pre-event, and that's what I'm going to talk about. It'll focus on developing relationships and collaborations. And I think it's really the important one that I put three times. It's like real estate where you have location, location, location. For pre-event, it's all about being prepared. Uh, an important piece of that is how to test your plan, how to do an exercise, uh, how to evaluate it, and then uh, make appropriate modifications. Jenny will talk about during the event how you utilize those partnerships and relationships that you develop as part of your planning process, uh, how you deliver uh, consistent advice, and how you coordinate your messages, and then both how you start the advisory and how you end the advisory. Uh, that can sometimes be something everyone needs to be on the same page of is that do we need to have X number of coliform tests or do we wait Y amount of time, whatever those uh, boundary conditions are, those need to be talked about in advance. And then Lisa will wrap up and talk about the post-event. Uh, again, this is a little bit different than an exercise where you're just walking through the pre-event and doing the testing for that. But after a real event, uh, how do you go out and have discussions both with your customers and with your partners? So your utility and the health department might meet and say, you know, what worked, what didn't work. And then how do you incorporate those changes into your operation plan so that you improve what you do overall. So again, we'll walk through all three of these steps during all three presentations. This is a graphic that just shows the same thing that was in that text on the previous slide. And again, uh, starting at the left with getting prepared, and then what we'll do during the advisory, uh, the after action evaluations, and then the feedback loop that takes you back into the getting prepared step. So again, there's four main categories in, uh, when you're trying to get prepared before an advisory. Uh, how do you organize yourself? How do you collaborate with your partners? Uh, how do you develop a message? And then how do you conduct an exercise? And I'll go into a little bit of detail about each one of these. So when you're organizing, the first thing you need to do is con conduct an assessment of your assets and the necessary resources. And I think it's important to talk about a few things here. One is that Again, coming from some of my background and work with security and vulnerability assessments, when you think about assets, you just sometimes have a tendency to think about uh, physical pieces of hardware. I got a pump station here, I got a tank over here. But what you need to also think about is that what kind of communication assets do you have? Uh, what kind of tools do we have uh, within our utility or within the county? Uh, how do we get the, the messages out? Do we have uh, pre scripted messages? Do we have communications plan? You know, these assets are both uh, physical and, and communication assets. And they're also, you got to include your personnel. You know, in some cases, you may have a public information officer like Jeannie, but in some cases, it may be a small utility and it's the general manager, it's the head of operations. Because you don't have a big staff, you've got 15 people on your staff, so everybody's kind of a jack of all trades. So you need to think about, you know, understand and, and assess all these assets. And again, for the assessments, the, the toolbox has templates and checklists that will help you sort of organize your thinking, uh, write everything down, and, and, and just put everything in one place. 
You should also take a look at your state regulations and any guidance uh, for the public notification regulation. Uh, there's a lot of good information from EPA, but again, state by state regulations can vary. So just it always helps to refresh yourself on what what exactly in your state regulations. You need to take a look at your communication plan. Again, that assumes that you have a plan. Uh, if you don't, this may be the time to start. And again, this plan may not, may not have to be a 100-page notebook. You may have, you know, one page on a half a dozen kind of typical events from, you know, a hurricane is coming to a bowl of water, and just have some sort of thought process laid out to do that. You want to think about how you're going to plan out your media activities. Uh, and we'll talk more about having partnerships, but you want to have these relationships established with these media people ahead of time. You don't want to uh, first have the conversation when you're in the middle of a boil water advisory. You want to have a relationship and a dialogue going so that if you call this media person and they're not there, you know you're going to get called back because you have an established relationship. And again, uh, finally, we want to make sure that communications are integrated into the uh, EOP. So again, uh, the next step will be collaborating with your partners, and the next slide will, will go into some detail of uh, who, who are partners you might consider. Uh, again, the toolbox has uh, templates and checklists, so you can you know, write out the name of the agency, who the person is, uh, what their contact information is, you know, uh, uh, landline, cell phone, email, uh, however you might want to get a hold of them. And again, you want to develop your own network. You know, who are you going to talk to during this event? not just a public health agency, so this might be, and it will go on the next slide, you know, your health department, but it might also be fire and rescue. And then do you have large customers that are important to talk to? Do you have a, a large hospital? Or do you have a, a college in your town? Do you have people that you'd want to talk to uh, during an event? It's a good idea to try and meet with people beforehand. Again, uh, it just, just to have clarity so they know what you're going to do, what they're expected to do. And again, a, a college is a good example. Your, your role might be to get the information to the college, and then the college has their own communication networks through uh, text messaging and email with all their students to be able then to further disseminate that message once you've given it to them. And again, the more you can talk, the more you can have a dialogue, the more you can communicate, uh, the better these collaborations will be. So again, this is just a list of, of um, different partners to think about. Again, if you're in a, a state where you've got uh, a separation between the, the public health department and the privacy agency, uh, you want to make sure you talk to both of them. If you're talking to public health, you've got a lot of issues to consider. Uh, you, you may have susceptible populations. You may have a large population with multiple languages. How are you going to translate? There might be community organizations, uh, faith-based organizations or other groups that are uh, good communicators. And then how are you going to talk to your health care providers, uh, your hospitals and clinics, and then uh, food service. So again, all those are critical. And a lot of these different uh, bullets here have their own communication channels on how to get the message out. Uh, with water systems, uh, if you're a, a, a wholesaler to other systems, you've got to make sure you have a plan in place to talk to those consecutive systems. You might have regional groups like we do here in D.C through the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. They've got some great communication tools that are used effectively because we have two states in the district and, and you're going beyond that, that um, uh, one state communication channel. There are other areas like that. I know in the Bay Area in San Francisco, uh, they've got a good sort of regional group for collaboration. And then what are they going to do with alternative water? You know, uh, uh, do you have suppliers that you're going to deal with? How are they going to know how to kick it in? Local government. Uh, again, not just the, the elected entity and their staff, but you may want to think about how you talk to schools and or colleges and universities, uh, the fire and rescue and EMS. And then you may want to think about, in some cases, these county governments have really upped their communication channels in the last decade uh, based on a lot of funding that's come out of uh, Department of Homeland Security to be better prepared. For example, a lot of counties have reverse 911 um, hardware and software it might be a good communication channel during a specific event. So now that you've uh, figured out all your assets and figured out all your partners, you want to try and figure out what you're going to say. You know, what, what's the message you want to deliver? And so again, you can use your network to help you uh, tailor your messages for these different audiences. In other words, uh, if you're trying to develop for a college student, they want, want something very just short and sweet because the college kids are used to Twitter, 
140 characters, you want to try and just you know make that make that fit for them. Again, you might want to think about how you're going to translate and for, format messages for these different populations. You've got non-English speakers and visually impaired, and there usually are groups that are good enough to translate to reach out to them. You just have to figure out who the point person is uh, for the different ethnic populations. They'll get the message out. Once you get it to them, they'll translate it, but you got to set all that up before. So one way to do this is through message mapping, and I'll show you one on the next slide, but really it's a pretty, I think, a robust tool to help you get your point across. So it kind of forces you into coming into one main message. You've got three sub-messages, and then below each message of that, you've got three facts that help support your sub-messages. So it's kind of a three-by-three three matrix with one main message above. This is really a technique that's been detailed pretty nicely in an EPA report on risk communication in action, and then that shows you the report number and how to get it from the Office of Research and Development. There are other tools to use to develop message. Another one is a single overriding communication objective. The, the acronym for that is SOCO. Uh, that's another nice tool that helps you, again, uh, work on your, your key messages, uh, your key facts, and who your target audience is going to be. And again, this toolbox has uh, templates, blank forms, for both doing the message maps and for developing, if you want to take the SOCO format, yeah, it, it has the forms for, for both of those. So again, this, this next slide is one of an example message map. And so again, you can see uh, your main message at the top. You've got contamination suspected or, and or found in the tap water. Uh, take action before drinking or cooking. And then again, it gives you the, the uh, three sub-messages, boil water for drinking and cooking. Uh, the, the testing confirmed the presence of E. coli in the water. If you can't boil the water, disinfect it. And then it gives you a little more factoids below that. You know, if you, if you want to, uh, if you can't boil the water when it's disinfected, it tells you exactly how many drops of bleach to per gallon of water. So you want these uh, three subs to be factoids that support your individual sub-messages. So again, I found this to be a useful tool for a lot of different things, even outside advisories. If you're trying to make a point across in a presentation sometimes, you can take this out and say, what's my main message I want to say? And then what are the three sub-messages and what are the, the three facts that support you to the sub-message? So sometimes, in, in, for example, in working with EPA or Congress, we've used this to try and then map out our message and just be very, it helps crystallize your thinking. Uh, it helps you use less words to get your point across. It's like that old Ben Franklin story, if I had more time, I could have written a shorter letter. It really forces you to minimize your words, and I think that's why I, I personally like using these message maps. And then finally, the, the, the last thing to do for getting prepared is to think about conducting exercises. Uh, there are some great federal resources that are out there. Uh, I think NIMS is a good way to at least understand uh, how to organize your uh, response and recovery framework, uh, how, to, how to divide up your organization into different categories. There's also some uh, very useful information under the Homeland Security Exercise and Evaluation Program, HCEP is the acronym. It's a very standardized system for developing exercises. Uh, there's some great training on how to do this through the, the DHS slash FEMA website. Kind of walks you through these modules and just helps you understand uh, the range of exercises you might do from uh, a tabletop to a, a full-scale exercise. Again, most of these you probably want to do some sort of tabletop exercise. The key thing is to make sure that you include some of your outside partners. You just don't do these tabletops internally because it may work great within your own organization, but you really need to have these other players. So it's a nice idea to try and, and, and plan out these exercises and conduct them regularly. You know, whether you do them every year in perpetuity is, is something you have to decide on your own, but I think it's, it's a good idea if you can, at least the first few years, to conduct some annual exercises. And you can make the scenarios to start pretty simple. Uh, we've had a, a, a power outage. Uh, we lost power at the water plant for 12 hours. Now what do we do? And then finally, uh, after you do these exercises, you want to debrief and then revise your plan accordingly. You want to use after action reports uh, as they provide the foundation for making the revisions. And again, we have templates in the toolbox for how to do those reports. So we had a whole host of, uh, of helpers on this project. Uh, you can see on the left the advisory group. 
that provided advice throughout the project. And then on the right, we had a technical work group that provided technical input. And in fact, if we listed everybody involved in this project, it'd be multiple slides. These are kind of like the highlights of people that spend a lot of time and effort. So that wraps up my presentation on getting prepared. And we'll move now and go to Jeannie Bailey next. We'll talk about the blessed event at Fairfax Water. Thanks, Alan. Thanks very much. I uh, appreciate that. I want to add my thanks also to uh, Daryl and to Asdwa for hosting this. Uh, I really believe this is um, a great event to, to partner with Asdwa on. Um, it, there's, no, there's no doubt in my mind that, uh, you know, as much as we try to get the information out there about this toolbox, that uh, it's, the, uh, it's the folks on the front line at the, at the state offices that are going to uh, hopefully really going to be able to use this tool uh, in, in your communications with the many, many different types and sizes of systems that you work with. So I get to, to talk about um, the blessed event and how that is working. And uh, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty here because my slides are not advancing. Hang on one. Oh, there we go. I got, I got it going. So. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's involved uh, in, in, uh, in the event itself. Who do you talk to? Um, how do you know you're, you're talking to all the right people? Um, you might need to make new friends along the way. Um, you need to send out an announcement. Something's going on and you need to tell what it's about. And then, uh, then we all might want to pass out some cigars and, and, and celebrate a little bit when, we, uh, when we're done with it. And really, you know, that just covers the four basic steps of what we're talking about. Uh, for an event, the initiating, preparing for, distributing, and ending that event, all, all very important tasks. And then when I'm done with that, I want to give you a little bit of an example of uh, three events that Fairfax Water has been involved with um, to give you an example of how we uh, implemented some of this. One of the things that uh, Alan talked about was that we hoped that uh, the presentation of this toolbox was in a very logical format. Uh, and I'm just going to, throughout my, my slides, you're going to see just um, some, some uh, clips from the toolbox itself um, that talk about uh, different issues. This particular uh, flowchart is talking about how to issue a drinking water advisory. What, you know, what are the steps involved? And you'll see right there at the top, um, in partnership with the utility, is the Primacy Agency. It's a, a very in, in important uh, step along the way, and it's certainly um, one that needs to be emphasized uh, in every every step of this that uh, the water system and the primacy agency really you know that's got to be the primary uh, partnership uh, in, in any of these processes um, here we go um, so how do we initiate the advisory um, who, who do we talk to and, and what do we do and you know the very first step in initiating an advisory is is collect the facts what what's going on how do you know you need an advisory you may you may not uh, so the very first thing you, you need to do is, is uh, from an internal perspective in the utility, you've got to get your facts together. You've got to get the, the, the right folks in the utility together to be talking about uh, what's going on and what information you have and what other information you need. And then the next phone call you need to make is to your primacy agency. You need to find out, do we have an event? Do we agree that there's an event that we need to talk to, to other people about? Is, is there something that we need to issue some sort of an advisory on? Um, so that's really the decision time. What's What's, what's going on? Um, then we want to need to find out uh, uh, where this event would be, where it's the location of this event. And there's a great uh, little map in the advisory. And I really am having technical. There we go. Let's try. I'm having a hard time figuring out which button put to push to get the uh, next slide up. I apologize for that. Um, you know, we really need to understand where the, where the advisory is. This is just a nice example that's in the, uh, in the toolbox as well that, that just kind of gives you uh, pretty much a, a Google Maps view of what's going on that you can highlight an area and say, this, you know, we're talking north of this street, south of that street, east of that street, west of that street, and you, you can really block out uh, what you're talking about. And then you need to figure out who your partners are. Where, where are you, uh, you know, who else do you need to talk to? That could be that could be your uh, 
wholesale customers. If you're not if you're not a single system, that could be a wholesale customer. That could be your local health department. Um, you can get creative. What other organizations are out there that can help you uh, spread the word? Is that if you're in a um, if you're in an area that's um, predominantly not English speaking, there might be a, several outlets that that would be available to you. There there might be different media sources that rather than the mainstream media sources that you might want to consider. Who who are your partners and who else do you need to talk to um, to organize uh, what you're doing? And Alan's been at, spent a good amount of time in, in uh, talking about the preparation that needs to go into this. What, when you get to this part of an event, you should have that list developed. That should have been your prep work. You should have that list developed and know who, who else you need to call to um, alert them as to what, what's going on and what needs to happen. Uh, hopefully you're noticing a theme in my slides. Uh, the next thing you need to do is, again, when you're preparing an advisory, talk to your primacy agency. Understand what the expectations of the primacy agency are and what what you need to do. Um, I we are lo Fairfax Water is is uh, located in Virginia. We're the uh, largest drinking water utility in Virginia. Uh, we've had to do exactly one boil water notice in our history, uh, and uh, I'm very well acquainted with that. The the very first thing that we ever want to do is is talk to our primacy agency when there when an issue comes up because these are the folks that really are going to help us get our heads around uh, what's going on. We want to talk to our partners. Uh, what are their concerns? What are their issues? What questions do they have that we may not have thought of along the way that we that we make sure we're we're covering? How are you going to know which message you're going to pull out of your 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 bin here? What's the information that you're basing your message on? Did you do a message map? Did you do a SOCO? Um, does your privacy agency have a particular um, set of information that you want to make sure uh, that you're developing into your messages? Um, so how how are you going to determine your message? Who is going to deliver that message? And it might be how many are going to deliver that message. Um, you know, you may need you may need many voices with one message. There's there's lots of different ways to get messages out, and you may need to recognize that uh, depending on which which part of the message you're talking about, that might be different people that need to deliver that message. And the reality is, there will always be multiple people delivering your message. You're, once you get your message out there you're always going to have somebody else delivering it for you once it goes beyond your borders. Uh, and then who needs to approve that message? Who's, uh, whose permission do you need to get uh, to, to continue with this process? Who else do you need to talk to and make sure that everybody's on board with the information and the message that you're putting out? Now, there are 10 requirements for a uh, certified and, and, and legitimate public notice. And these, these 10 requirements come out of EPA's uh, public notification rule. The beauty, I'm not going to ask you to try to read all those, those 10 requirements. The beauty is that the toolbox has a template that meets all of those requirements, that meets all 10 of those requirements. They have it in English. They have it in Spanish. Um, there's, a, there's a number of other advisory templates for other formats other than the other than the public notification requirement, there's there's uh, templates or there's ideas about how to how to make short messages. What what uh, an automated message might look at look like. What you might want to think about for putting on a phone message. Those kinds of things. There's templates for frequently asked questions. There's there's several worksheets in there that have have we that with the uh, very large evaluation group and and uh, community that went into developing this toolbox. There's lots of uh, lots of good input as to what what the frequently asked questions might need to be for different types of advisories, and they're out there for uh, uh, especially for boil water. Uh, notice I know that they're in there. Um, there's a press release template. Um, when you're talking about who to find to put that message out for you, who that spokesperson should be, there's a checklist for the spokesperson to make sure they're prepared uh, when they go out from behind closed doors and start delivering this message. So that spokesperson. Uh, checklist is a very important thing, um, and there's so much more. There, there's there's uh, lots and lots and lots of additional information in the toolbox. So now it's time to come from behind closed doors. You've talked to all your partners. You've gotten your message together. You've figured out who's going to um, deliver that message, and you're ready to go out and distribute that message. What's the very first thing you need to do? Yes, folks, that's right. You want to talk to your primacy agency. You want to make sure that everybody's on board, everybody knows you're about to push the button, and you've agreed on how you're going to do it, when you're going to do it, and who's going to do it. 
Uh, and one more thing I'd like to remind folks about is that you want to make sure that your boss knows what you're doing, and you want to make sure that your boss's boss knows what you're doing. Uh, I, I work in a, uh, a public utility, and you want to make sure that not just your appointed uh, uh, officials know what's happening, but especially your elected officials know what's about to go on. Uh, again, you're not going to, it's not going to be in your control once you start putting the message out. It's what, what you put out is absolutely in your control. But once it leaves you, you're, you're going to have to understand that there's going to be lots of folks that are going to be uh, putting this message out for you. You want to make sure that that message is clear and understandable and that even your friends know what you're talking about because they're going to be turning around and say, yep, Jeannie works, I know Jeannie works for Fairfax Water and she said, and you want to make sure that what what uh, what your friends might be saying is correct and accurate as well. And then you need to be make sure that media mayhem is going to happen, so you need to be prepared for um, how to deal with the media and, and what that might look like. Uh, you might want to consider automated messages. You might want to consider something on your phone service. You might want to consider something like reverse 911, depending on what the, the issue is, whether that's going to be flyers that you pass door to door, using your website, using social media. There's appropriate um, places for all of those things. Uh, the key there is to understand what's appropriate for your audience and how you want to distribute that message. And when it comes time to pass out the cigars, uh, again, you want to check with your primacy agency. You want to make sure they're on board. You want to make sure all the steps have been taken, the checklist, everything on the checklist list has been checked off, that you are indeed ready to end an advisory. And then you actually have to issue an, uh, a that, that message again. So you want to talk to your partners, make sure they're all on board, they're ready to distribute that message as well. Make sure your boss and your boss's boss are on board, they all know it's about to come to an end. And then you need to talk to a whole bunch of people all over again. Uh, this is, it's not a one, it's not a one-time message, it's a, it's an updated message, it's a changing message, and it's an ending message. So you have to be prepared to, to put another message out there that says, Thanks for your cooperation, and we have uh, resolved the issue, and we're you know ready to move on. Uh, so, again, lots of time to be talking. I want to give you just an example of three events that happened with us at Fairfax Water, um, and talk about really the different sizes uh, of advisories and the different uh, impacts that advisories uh, can have. The first one was a uh, an example of a hurricane, and this was a this was a regional event. Really, this happened. Uh, not just to Fairfax Water, but to our wholesale customers and to um, the service area, uh, the entirety of the service area, not just our retail area that, that happened. Uh, Hurricane Isabel, some of you may recall, uh, came through in 2004. Uh, it hit the coast of North Carolina at, at uh, uh, 11.50 in the morning. It came through Virginia for the rest of the day. Uh, it came through in a, in a massive way. Um, Dominion Power, who's the primary um, uh, electrical provider in Virginia lost 80% of their service area that day. Uh, and it came through from the coast of Virginia moving uh, northwest. Uh, I just want to point out that that means it came through Richmond before it came through northern Virginia, and that will play an important role here in just a moment. Uh, we lost power intermitt intermittently throughout the day. Uh, our staff was with, uh, we, we, had, uh, we had stood up in our own uh, in our own offices, our, our staff with our own emergency crews, and then we also had staff at the County Emergency Operations Center. Um, and most of the county, not all of the county, was without power for that day. We lost power to both of our treatment plants at about 11 p.m. On that, on that Thursday. And then we started losing pressure in our system, in the northern and western parts of our system, because they were the higher elevations at about 4 a.m. We ended up issuing a boiled water notice at 5 and our call volume picked up dramatically about 6 when people started getting up and realized that they didn't have water and we began receiving email complaints at about 7. So I just want to go back and talk a little bit uh, for just a second about uh, being in the EOC and uh, the things that had, and, and losing power throughout Virginia first. So in the EOC, um, our table was literally right next to the local health department's table. Uh, and one of the things that we learned in this process uh, and we didn't learn it soon enough, actually, but one of the things we learned in this process is that your local health department can act as your primacy agency in an emergency. Um, these are all good lessons to learn. They might have been really better learned before the hurricane, but we, we now know them, and this is, this is good stuff. Um, 
And then the other thing I want to talk about is that um, uh, when power went out to uh, Richmond first, the Virginia Department of Health's main office is in Richmond, and the emergency number um, that you call when you have a problem, uh, uh, the 24-7 line uh, is stationed through Richmond. Um, but those lines were down and those communications were inoperable during this hurricane. Uh, so as we were desperately trying to get hold of our uh, regional office, our, our local office, uh, for our primacy agency, um, communication was down all over the place. And we literally used the state police to go, uh, to go knock on the door of uh, one, of our, one of our primacy agency folks and uh, get them to call us and talk about issuing a boil water notice and those kinds of things. So when, when we finally were able to make communication with our regional office, we did issue that boil water notice at 5 a.m. A um, little more synopsis on the, on the hurricane. Power was restored to our largest treatment plant at about noon the following day. We were about 13 hours without power. We restored pressure to the system about midnight that next day, and we began water quality testing at midnight. Uh, I was in constant contact with the county folks. Um, we were uh, continually sending message back, messages back and forth. Um, the press release was written for the boil water notice that was issued at, at 5 a.m. We wrote that the night before. We, everybody had signed off on it. We made sure we had the right folks in the room to sign off on that. When we got hold of the, the uh, folks at the health department, they signed off on it as well. We called on our customer service reps at about 4 a.m. and we started changing the recorded response on our phone system to reflect the boil water notice. We issued that press release at 5 a.m. Uh, we called in our webmaster at about 9. Uh, what we found was that not all of the county was without power, and the half of the county that, that had power was the half of the county that had no water. Uh, and the, the, the part of the county that had, no, had, had water had no power, uh, so we weren't hearing from them. We weren't, we weren't hearing about who had water. We were only hearing about who did not have water. Um, and we started receiving emails, and, I, and our belief is we started receiving emails because the phone system was, was overwhelmed. Uh, what we also realized is that uh, folks were going to the website looking for information and they, they weren't getting it there. Um, so we called in the, the webmaster, we, we got a message up about 1030 and, and we started uh, updating it from there and we'll talk about that a little bit more here. Um, we did several TV and radio interviews throughout the day uh, and I actually moved to the county EOC at about 1 p.m. Uh, on that Friday it was embedded that the county EOC had import, um, uh, reporters embedded there, um, so I spent the next 24 hours or so with them. Um, we updated uh, the website to reflect the return of power. Uh, we continued to do interviews for the next two days. We updated the website Saturday to reflect the water quality sampling, and we uh, issued. We, I'm sorry, we lifted the boil water notice on Sunday evening. Now between. Uh, Friday morning and Sunday evening when that notice was lifted, uh, part of what happened in that process was that as, as our plants were down and we ran out of water, our wholesale customers began running out of water as well, um, and they, they had to issue boil water notices as well. Um, by the time that the notice was lifted on Sunday evening, it was a regional uh, event. It was not just a Fairfax water event, and we did coordinate with uh, the local health departments, with the primacy agency. Uh, and with the communicators and all of those uh, areas, and we lifted it as a region. It was, it was not an individual utility that lifted a, a boil water notice, it was the region that lifted the boil water notice. Um, some things we didn't expect, we didn't expect the level of vulnerability that we had in our system. We had two plants on two power feeds that had two different substations from two different transmission lines, and everything failed. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, 80% of Virginia's power system went out that day. Um, the, power, the power failure was not uniform. Uh, we got emails at 7 o'clock in the morning complaining about lack of water. Some things that we learned, the website uh, is a very powerful tool, uh, much more powerful than we had contemplated. And now when we talk about messaging and when we talk about part of the way that we're going to communicate messages in the future, whether they be advisories or just information, um, we're gonna, we use our website as, as a tool for that. Um, and here are some of the statistics that back that up for us. Typically, um, in August of, of that year, the total pages transferred on our website were about a million a month. Um, in September, we had seven times that. As a matter of fact, we had as much in those three days as we would normally have 
in a, in a monthly transfer. When people in our phone system is overwhelmed, we learned that people turn to our website. Uh, we weren't prepared for that. We weren't prepared to put messages on our website quickly. Um, we are now prepared to put messages on our website quick, quickly. Uh, we needed to date stamp the message. We found that we could reduce call volume by simply changing the time and date stamp on the message on the website. Uh, the, the, uh, there was a direct correlation. It didn't matter if we changed a single word in the information that was on the website about the particular event, but if we changed the date stamp, uh, calls went down. People, people thought we were keeping them informed. They, want, they felt like we were um, uh, being up to date with them and giving them the latest information. Uh, the next event that happened was uh, the lead event in DC uh, for the next on January 30th, 2004, the Washington Post announced the elevated lead levels in, in Washington, DC, and they ran a front page uh, either on the, the first or the second section of the post. They ran a front page article for the next 30 days consecutively. Um, that was a big deal here in this in this media market. Uh, and we got a chance to to apply some of the lessons we had learned from from Isabel to uh, this. Now this was not, this was not a, a, where, where, the, where Isabel was a, a, a Northern Virginia regional event that affected all of our customers. This was an event that was um, utility based and it, it was uh, an information spillover so to speak where um, what, what was happening in one location was creating concern in other locations. So there had to be uh, messaging that, that went out about that. So, so we had to advise our customers what was happening in our system and, and, what, and what that meant. So we immediately put up a phone message and we immediately put information about uh, our lead sampling program on, our, on the front page of our website and we linked to Q&As about it. We, expect, we did experience an increased call volume for about a week. Um, we continued to update the Q&As on the website. We put the, the new date stamps on. Um, and we only, in total, we only received about a re request for about 140 uh, samples. Out of 235,000 metered accounts, we thought 140 was a pretty big win uh, in terms of getting the message out and, and keeping people's um, questions answered and uh, uh, relieving their concerns. Some things that we did about that is, is uh, these two events back to back like this, uh, our web person is, is now part of essential personnel. We, that we have access 24-7, 365 to make sure that we can get messages updated and messages on our, on our web when, when we need to. Uh, when we put important information on our web, there's always a date stamp and a time stamp with that. Uh, and that uh, we, we learned our lesson, the web is a very, very powerful tool. There was a third incident, and it was a very, very localized incident to a very, very, very small portion of our, of our uh, distribution system. In uh, March of 2007, we had an ammonia overfeed at one of our plants, um, and the, the customers closest to that treatment plant, um, it, there were very noticeable levels of ammonia uh, in the water, uh, so much so that one of the customers called uh, a 911 when uh, their child was showering because it was such a traumatic event for them. Um, there was no harm done uh, to the child. There was no immediate health risk uh, to our customers, but it became a very big uh, event for that small portion of the community. So we were able to implement uh, our communication strategy. We immediately put a message on our website. We immediately put pre-recorded messages on our phone system. We started a collaboration with the county office of public affairs to make sure that they were on board um, and that went out to the local health department as well we put out a release to the media let them know what was going on we partnered with um, the local uh, police department to use their reverse 911 system and the way that we did that is we identified the area that we were dealing with and the closest we could get between our system and their system was to use a zip code um, and we created a message that was um, uh, then transmitted uh, to that zip code uh, through the phone systems. And we used what was, what's called in this area a community emergency alert network and this is a, uh, this is a uh, really a, a text uh, messaging alert system. People can sign up. It's, a, it's a, a sign in program. People choose to be part of the program and, and part of um, you, you sign up to get messages about traffic, about 
events about what it, you know you can choose categories for what you want but we use, we utilize that system with through the county's communication office to get that message out uh, to the folks in the county one one note of, of caution is you really need to understand the tools that are available to you and the tools that other partners might offer you um, just an anecdote on the reverse 911 this happened in the evening um, and the event was pretty much cleared up we had crews out flushing uh, for the through the night and that this event was cleared up you know by the time folks woke up the next morning there was really uh, nothing more for folks to know or need to know or need to do no action needed by our customers at that point um, and about 10 o'clock that morning I had a guy from the police de police department call me and ask me if I wanted to discontinue the 9 the reverse 911 message and I kind of blankly said I'm sorry excuse me and they said uh, yeah, that it's still running. I said, well, why is it still running? And they said, well, there were, you know, literally thousands and thousands of phone calls to make, and they've only gone through the first couple of thousand of them. I said, pull the plug, unplug the machine, stop it, kill it, do what you got to do. Um, so it's really important to know what tools are being offered to you and have the conversations beforehand with with your partners to understand what the capacity of those tools might be and how you might be able to use them. Um, and just some statistics on our website usage from uh, from that ammonia event, our, our typical uh, visitors per week at that time was about 7,100. We had 11,000 uh, on those days, a 65% increase over what we normally see. And that's just another example of what that might look like. Um, we, we actually tracked what hours folks were looking at our, our website and when the hits started to go up to our website. So we added that message between 8 and 9 o'clock uh, that, that evening. We put it on the website, or a pre-recorded message on the phone. Um, the, the 10 and 11 o'clock news cycle hit, and we noticed that there was a very large increase in the number of hits to our website after the 11 o'clock news cycle. So folks were hearing the information on the news, um, and then they were going to look to find more information because at that point it's the middle of the night and where else are you going to go? You're not going to get, you're probably not going to get uh, uh, through on a phone very easily and, uh, or if you did, if you did go, you got a pre-recorded message on our phone system, but folks were going to the website to look for those, uh, look for that information. And then we used our website. It was very hard to identify exactly which streets uh, might have been affected. We had a we had an area that we thought was probably going to be affected, but having this information about uh, people using our website, we thought it would be effective to uh, put a communication on our website uh, uh, to our customers about what happened and 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 what we've done to correct it and whatnot. And we found that uh, even though it was a slow start the first week, we had about four thousand people open and download that letter. So we thought that was a pretty pretty big win. Uh, again, I just want to thank uh, ASWA for, for hosting this. I think it's a very important uh, process, and uh, I appreciate being with you all today. I'm going to turn it over to Lisa now. Good afternoon. I'm so glad everybody was interested enough to join us today. I'm going to take off where most people stop with their advisories. Um, Jeannie mentioned passing out the cigars because it's all over. And if I had my brothers, people wouldn't be passing out cigars for six months to a year after an advisory because um, especially for consumers but also for communities as a whole, when you lift an advisory, it's not necessarily the end of the story. Thanks. All right, so you're going to you you have pulled people together or not, and you have handheld utilities as they've walked through, or you've had long ongoing discussions, or sometimes it's more perfunctory than that, but you lift a advisory or you end an advisory or you rescind an advisory. And it's over. Um, 
or at least that's what it's like in most people's mind. One of the things we found in both the evaluation and research for the toolbox is that actually a lot of the effects of an advisory linger and that there's a lot of things that you can learn and apply after an advisory. It's just not necessarily everybody's priority or forte. So we came up with a post-event checklist. It's outlined pretty clearly right there. I'm going to go through each section briefly and talk about some of the different pieces you can pull out and why they're valuable. So there's the steps again up close. Um, reporting requirements, debriefing, which is a slightly larger context, conducting an evaluation, moderating and updating, which I actually think are probably the two most difficult components and not often achieved. Reporting. Obviously, as primacy agencies, you're the star of that section. And it's always focused on the primacy agencies and a lot of regulatory. But the other part of it is, is that an opportunity or an ability to start doing some planning and evaluations? Um, is there information on that form that being, can be gathered to either help that utility the next time or, more importantly, to get a picture of how things go in the state and what are the reasons for advisories and different aspects that might be able to inform how to set up a better program for issuing, a, especially a Tier 1 notification. The next step, are these do not have to be sequen sequential. We listed them. So uh, because there's different kinds of debriefings, a lot of people are familiar, especially with preparedness, about hot washes. There's also formal and informal, which means either you bring a lot of people together and it's very well planned and you may even have somebody coming in to conduct the debriefing, or it's a few people sitting around a table taking down lessons learned. It can either be entirely within either an agency, like a primacy agency, or within a utility, or you can bring in your collaborators or partners or a combination of both. The tools in this section for debriefing are a discussion guide, a feedback form, and a debriefer evaluation form. And a lot of these are actually based on either EPA tools or from the Washington State Department of Health Emergency Preparedness Book. We just simply kind of streamline them and simplify them for this. The other thing about the debriefing tools is that they can be used for exercises and vice versa. And Alan was talking about all of the federal resources that are available for NIMS. I'd also like to say that having an evaluation or a debriefing or an exercise on a smaller scale is really valuable so that even within your agency or within a small group, having an informal exercise can sometimes be as valuable as having a formal one. So evaluation. I come out of a public health background, and when you do communications and health promotion, you do an evaluation. And I found in my work with drinking water that that's probably not as often the case. But there's a lot of available data sources that are already there, and there's different types of evaluations. But the value in that is, again, finding the weaknesses, finding the strengths, and where you need to go next. So even if it's a very small, concise evaluation, there's value in getting something done and getting some data together. The evaluation tools in the toolbox are things like how to pull information out of a call center or customer service center data. So if in the event of a large scale, emergency, you would have call center data from an ERC, or in the case of a utility like Genie, or even a smaller one, you would have some kind of customer service data. There's a community survey available, and this survey is based on one that was done in the UK that actually assessed how people understood the words in an advisory and whether or not they took action. And then there's also some informal suggestions. Some of the things that are more challenging to implement, um, especially because you want to move towards organizational change, within the primacy agency, there may be, and also within 
between government agencies. Obviously, the toolbox is very much geared towards utilities, but as primacy agencies, you've got relationships with local government and county government, as well as different agencies within the state that you need to make go back and do some training, build a communication work, or end up doing some other types of training. Some of the implementation tools are a corrective action tracking form so that you can set up goals and figure out different ways that you want to actually implement these in the field and make the changes. A basic standard operating procedures update and a follow-up memo. And especially if you're working with other agencies or with a number of utilities, it becomes very important to use those follow-up memos both to track and to communicate information. The other thing about even just sending out a follow-up memo is that you're helping to solidify those collaborations and communications. This is the communications assessment, and this is actually in every section of the toolbox. And the idea is that you, whether you're sending out a memo in your organization, you're putting together an advisory, or you're putting together a report, those are the basic pieces of information that need to be in communications. How much information is on each one of those and whether or not it changes is up to the different event. It just helps focus that, you, that you're going through and you're understanding what should have been there or what could help. The next tool we have to show you is the um, standard operating procedures update form. And again, it's just a suggested structure of things to think about or even to formulate a discussion. And these are also some of the things that might be able to use if you're doing a vulnerability assessment or if you're updating an emergency response plan. And I know that a lot of the states help a lot of different utilities with that. Um, you have very specific user-focused elements so that it's looking at who's taking what part of what action either for the next event or for an exercise so that you have people so you can follow a chain of command or see where it needs to be followed up and it's more concrete than just kind of a general understanding or reviewing your notes. The next thing I'd like to talk about is the customer perspective. And I think one of the things that happens based on both experience and from doing actual research and evaluation is that everybody involved with an advisory a lot of times tends to lose focus on the fact that there's customers and that an advisory isn't simply for regulatory compliance. I found in a couple of evaluations when you ask utilities and agencies, why are you sending out a notice? And it's because the public notification rule says I have to. If you take a step back, you're sending out a notice to tell the public or to tell consumers that they need to be aware of something, here's some information, and or you need to take an action. So the first thing a lot of customers say is, you said my water's safe. You always tell me my water's safe. I saw it in my CCR. I see it in different communications. But then you sent me this tier one notice that said I maybe should boil my water or I have to boil my water and it's not safe. And now you're saying it's safe again. This is a really big point with consumers, especially if it was a positive coliform test, but it was negative for any kind of pathogen. That's a very complicated message, but it's one that really stays with people and it's an important consideration as you go forward. Okay, it might be safe, the drinking water might be safe for me, but is it safe for my family? It's one thing for me to maybe risk drinking the water, but it's another thing to give it to my baby or to use it in the bathtub. And is this going to happen again? Can I really, is this going to happen every week? Is there something really wrong with my water system? And can I trust you? You said my water's safe and you said it wasn't safe. Is that true and who do I believe? These are the things you have to keep in the back of your head as you go forward, and these are, these are the questions that stay in the public's mind, which is why it becomes important to do the follow-up. 
there's a lot of different opportunities and types of public outreach. We didn't want to overwhelm or limit the creativity of utilities and states, so we gave a couple of suggestions. Surveys are actually one way of doing public outreach. Not only do you get information and data, but if you're building it in, depending on how it's built in, it also says, I know this was a big deal. We need to find out more information, and we're asking you, our consumers, our public, what you think or what you heard. The Consumer Confidence Report is not a bad opportunity to follow up, either by saying, this is what happened and why, or this is what a positive coliform test is, this is why col not all coliforms are pathogenic, this is why we had to issue a boil water advisory, but your water's still safe. Public meetings are probably not on the top of my agenda, but it's something that some areas are very familiar with. It also can be useful if it was a really big event or if it's part of a community culture. I actually think more preferable is to think of it as more community meetings where you're meeting with a neighborhood association or with specific organizations to answer their questions and follow up. So this is an example of some of the survey questions that are out there. Um, did you boil the tap water before you use it, yes or no? If you look at the few studies that have been done, usually around 50% of a population, this is not big advisories, but 50% of a group of people will hear that there was a boil water advisory on. Of that, about 35 to 50% might actually take the action of boiling their water. It's important to know whether or not consumers are doing it and if they're doing it correctly. The next question 5A is on there because in the studies that have been done, even if people did boil their water, they usually had at least two more exposures outside of just drinking the water. So that by the time you end up with it, on an average, perhaps 15 to 30 percent of a given population will actually com fully comply with the advice and boil water advisory. Uh, did you hear the advisory end on a date? A lot of times, the specific knowledge or when they heard it isn't known, and that's actually a very crucial role for what's known as word of mouth communications or friends, families, neighbors. Formal risk communication is another term for it, where there's actually a very important role outside of the formal communications because actually in the research that's been done, most people hear about the end of an advisory from another person in their social network, not from the news and not from the utility. Evaluation, there's a whole bunch of tools, like I said, and the, the survey is one side of it, the customer service is another. Some other considerations for after an advisory, was this a common event or an uncommon event? If it's the first time an area has ever issued a boil water advisory or a large scale advisory, that's a pretty big deal and people are really going to be questioning whether or not they're drinking water safe and who can I trust to tell me. There's different ways to use your data. There's, you can use it to change your communications channels. You can use it to try and find different information. Do you need more resources and customer service on the phone? Do you need more resources with the website? The implementing change, like I said, which I think is actually the hardest part. Identifying staffing and financial challenges. If you need to be able to move staff to different places, if you need to be having regional engineers or local engineers on call, that's how you can use this data to help make that case. And then trying to focus beyond the logistics and beyond the regulatory framework to think about there's consumers, there's a public involved with this, what's their perspective and what's their understanding and how do we address that in the future. So this is my short list of special thanks. And while I have the opportunity, there are a couple of ASDWA members that went above and beyond the call of duty who allowed us to harass them in perpetuity. So Cindy Forbes, who 
whose biggest contribution was that a do not use order should be a nuclear option, which we have all embraced. Um, Yvette de Pisa and her staff at Massachusetts Department of Health gave a huge amount to this project, including helping me connect with utilities to do evaluations. Lisa Daniels at Pennsylvania Department of Health and in the Washington Department of Health, Denise Clifford and Brad Harp and also Greg Grunenfelder. And then when I was adding this up, actually New York wins. Um, in the New York Department of Health, uh, Nick Cordera, John Strapelli, Craig Jackson, John Helms, and Paul Cutsey. And if I forgot anyone, I'm sorry, you're on my list. It's just a really long list. So we're all very grateful to this, for those contributions. And I'm going to turn it back over to Daryl for questions. OK, thank you. I appreciate all of the presenters. And we're going to now move into questions. Uh, Anthony is going to help us get set up and see what people have submitted. And the, all the panelists are still here. So if we have some questions, we'll be able to answer them. Huh? And here we've got a lot of, a number of questions to work through. So we'll see. We'll see what we can get. Okay. Just don't answer the ones that I'm answering. All right. We won't answer the ones about I lost the sound. Where did it go? Okay. Uh, we will start with a question from Joseph Chris Lalgo in California. Wants to know about uh, can we refer these tools on our web pages for water utilities? Can we place these tools on our web pages? Uh, I'm not sure if I know the answer to that. Maybe Alan does. Yeah, that's fine, Daryl. I can handle this one. So yeah, I think clearly uh, I can check with CDC about actually placing the PDFs on web pages. I don't think there. I think that will be okay. But let me just check with my folks at CDC. I mean, right off the bat, it's easy to put the the URLs or the the, the to send it to the CDC site. But let me double check. I don't think they'll have a problem with it. But I think that it's a good question. I'll get back to to Daryl and, and Joseph, and we can let you know. I can probably talk to the second one, if that'd be okay, Daryl. Yeah. So the second question is that how these tools relate, if they do, with CDC's crisis and emergency risk communication training and tools. Uh, we looked at those as part of it. You know, that's that's a, a piece of of um, the research that was done to put together the the, the different pieces of the toolbox. Um, Lisa, why don't you maybe finish up and talk about the the, uh, the structured search strategy to what you use to pull out the reference material? Okay, so the structured search strategy, because there's a huge volume of material and because we needed to use a search function within the documents, and we actually have both a research report and evaluation report available if people are interested, but we came up with significant or specific search parameters. We put them in a matrix and we searched on those parameters to come with both themes and then specifics within um, each document and also basic counts of certain words so we could better understand what was going on inside of all the different documents by classification. So we looked at guidance separately. We looked at actual rules separately. We looked at fact sheets separately to try and get a better picture of what we needed to put together and where we wanted to go with the toolbox. Uh, Joseph had another point, uh, which I think is important to at least emphasize, which is that on the tabletop top exercises, uh, be begin internally and gain proficiency in how, how to do it, how to conduct them, how to do the evaluation. And then you bring in the outside partners. And that's a good point. I, I've been on some of these exercises where you bring in the outside people right off the bat, and it kind of turns into a three-ring circus really fast. So the point being, particularly if you're a large organization, is run that exercise internally and get to a certain level of proficiency and then bring in maybe the next year um, the, the outside parties. A couple other points I want to make that I got an email from CDC and then I'm going to go to Jeannie for the next question. Um, is that if you have any any uh, feedback, uh, you know, any comments over, you know, in the future, uh, it, CDC and, and I would appreciate if you send those comments to me 
and then uh, and that's Alan Robertson at a r o b e r s o n at a w w a dot o r g. If you send those, you know, feedback to me, you know, we're looking at this being a adaptive management approach to this document. This is the first cut of it. At some point, we'll probably do a revision in the future. The timeline for that is to be determined. But we'd like to hear how people have used that and what their, you know, successes and, and, and problems with the toolbox have been. And then uh, CDC is also looking at trying to put this from a, a PDF into an HTML format so it's available uh, on the web in the future as our resources allow. So, Jenny, do you want to uh, maybe answer this question here about power? Sure. So, uh, Joseph had uh, several other questions, and they were, they were great uh, questions. The first one was, without power during Isabel, how was the messaging transmitted to the community? Great. And, uh, the power was intermittent, so there were there, two, two sides of that answer. From uh, Fairfax Water's perspective, we had generators at our building, so we, we, had, we had access to uh, the web, and we had access to our phone systems were up, um, and we had uh, a, the ability to get the message out to the media and, and conduct interviews uh, and those kinds of things and post messages. Um, the county EOC had the same capability. The problem came with who received the message, uh, and again, the, the part of the county that had power did not have water, and the part of the county that did not have uh, that did not have power um, had water that they shouldn't have been using. So uh, it became a, a, a challenge. We did a lot of community meetings. We went and met in the in the in the uh, part of the county that did not have power. We did a lot of community meetings down there, and we part partnered with uh, the county communications folks to get that message out in lots of different ways. Um, the next question, uh, also from Joseph, was how. Uh, on the regional lifting of the boil water notice, all clearance samples needed to be coordinated and timelined. How was that done? Uh, again, great question. Uh, we worked through the primacy agency in conjunction with our wholesale customers to make sure who was taking, you know, what, what samples had to be taken, when they were being taken, and when they would be done. The, um, the uh, lifting of the notice actually could have been staged throughout the day. Um, we could have lifted it in parts of the uh, retail system. Um, as early as 7 o'clock that morning, but because we wanted to make sure that this was a regional notice, um, we, we waited uh, several hours to make sure that the last sets of samples from all the different partners were, were uh, taken and cleared, and we lifted it as a region that way. So again, that was a, uh, you know, one of those situations where working very closely with the Primacy Agency and with the, with the uh, wholesale customers, that, that had to be coordinated and timed differently than it would have been for individual uh, utilities. And then finally, uh, how was the partnership implemented, implemented with medical facilities? Uh, great question. Um, not a great answer uh, on, the, on the initial round of this. Uh, we were not as prepared as we needed to be in uh, talking with our uh, medical facilities. We had, a, um, we had one very, very, very large hospital that went without water. Um, we talk to them on a very regular basis now. Um, and uh, we have a much better partnership uh, with them. This is an evolving and growing process. Again, as as you do this, and you and you have to uh, you, know, you have to learn from um, your experiences and, and grow from those experience experiences. So uh, um, uh, now we have regular conversations with uh, our medical communities to to talk about uh, our our facilities, um, how we how we've improved our vulnerabilities, and what they can expect from us. And they you know give us their expectations as well. So uh, back over to Daryl, I think. I, I want to follow up maybe with what Jeannie said about talking to the medical facilities. I mean, that was one of the reasons that we developed a second document that I showed in my presentation on the emergency water supply plan for hospitals with the thought that the hospitals need to be prepared to stand alone for 96 hours for water, just like they've been geared up for a long time on power with emergency generators. And so that document walks through the process to do that. But it's important to think in, in the context of all your critical customers. Again, you may have a, um, some hospitals that are always critical customers. You may have a, a college or university. Uh, you may have a, a major manufacturing facility. You might be Newport News that has an Anheuser-Busch brewery as, as one of their major customers. And so uh, they need to be part of that external partner group that you pull in. They need to be part of that group that you have regular communications with. And so it's really as part of your organizing it, you know who your critical customers are. It may not necessarily be your largest customers. It may be uh, a smaller customer might be very critical as far as the volume of water that they use. And uh, you want to make sure that everyone's informed and is brought into that planning process. Daryl? 
Okay, I think uh, I think we've pretty much gone through the questions that that are here. But those of you, if you have something that comes to your mind afterwards, you want to send me an email uh, with a particular question or issue, I can get back to the presenters and we can we can post that information uh, when we put the rest of it up for everybody's review. So, as I said earlier, uh, this will be. Uh, was recorded and will be will be posted on the website for everybody to look at. And, okay, and I have a little bit more information that Lisa is going to pass on to you before we wrap up. For those of you who either have excessive struggles or, um, as I do, an obsession with public notification well water advisories, um, ASTWA and AWWA and Fairfax Water, along with several others, are participating in a Water Research Foundation study on the cost and benefit of boil water advisories. And we're going to be asking um, the states to come and help us with specifically if you have any data on how many advisories occur in your state or if you've ever costed out an advisory. So we would very much, just a heads up that that will be coming out too. So. Thanks a lot. Thank you. That's a that's a good point. This work is never done. Seemingly, there's a, always a lot more to learn and uh, more information that we can pass along. So look for an announcement from us when the information is is posted, so you can go and look at it. And other people that were unable to be with us today can go and look at the uh, at the advisory webinar. And hopefully. Now that you've been primed with all this good information and how valuable this, these tools can be, hopefully you'll go look at the website and, and read through the information. And certainly uh, it's appropriate for, for you guys to go out to your water systems now and start spreading the word and, and getting uh, systems using this information as well. So hopefully it's been helpful to get to that point. And with that, I'm going to thank our presenters. Uh, Jeannie and Lisa and Alan again for sharing their time with us. And thank you all for sharing your time and hopefully it's proven to be a valuable tool. And if you have any follow-up that you need from, from Astoid, just let us know. Thank you.